As you know, we use this platform to share stories of resilience. And today I have a very special guest. Everybody, welcome to the Sally Allen Podcast. I am so glad you're here. I say that every time, and I really mean it. Um, my voice is a bit scratchy today. I have allergies and um, struggling through this, but we'll get through it. Today, I have a special guest. Her name is Ashley, and I am so excited to have her on the podcast. I met her a few weeks ago at a networking event, and I heard a little bit of her story, and I knew it was such a powerful story that I wanted her to share it with us here. And with that, I wanna welcome, Miss Ashley, welcome to the Sally Allen Podcast. Thank you so, so much for having me, honestly. I just feel like, uh, by the way, this is like my very first podcast, so I'm actually very, very excited, and I just feel like it is super important for people just to like, see other people's story and I feel like that can motivate and uplift a lot of people and when you see people go through things like I feel like you can relate and learn how to push through those things that's like the most important thing for me yeah yeah and I want to say like when you wherever you go you you drive a Maserati it's like a (laughs) freaking amazing car (laughs) but you're so unassuming that what people don't know about you is four years ago you were actually sleeping in your car Yes. Yeah. So I'd love for you to share your story with us. How do you go from sleeping in your car to having a pretty darn amazing car yourself? Like this (laughs) really (laughs) awesome car. Thank you. So, yes, um, honestly, it all started since I was a child. As a baby, um, my mom abandoned me when I was uh, six months, six months old. She abandoned me. She gave me away to my uncle and my aunt. Um, right when I think, you know, she's like, okay, you know, I got abandoned by my mother, you know, how can it get worse than that? (laughs) Well, unfortunately it did because I wasn't treated very equally in that household where they were supposed to take care of me. And you would think as a mother, I'm going to give my child away to a family who's going to take care of my child better than I ever could only to find out, um, it's not going to be nothing close to that. So I was very raised in a very, um, uh abusive home but not like in a way like i was the only one getting abused pretty much like um you know my mother had uh you know till this day i still call her mother because she raised me and um but anyways yes so she pretty much um abused me a lot she treated me very differently um uh way sad It, it gets it gets sad when i talk about it when i get into it because she she would choke me, slap me, hit me, punch me, bite me, everything you can think of. I mean, torture me, so many so many things that it's like, you know, how can you do that to a child, you know? But um, I grew up very depressed because I just felt like nobody had my back. I mean, I was alone, you know? And the worst part about everything, and then I, like, I hate, I hate because I feel like I have to remind people, like, don't be afraid to stick up for people. Like, if you see mm-hmm. somebody getting hurt, because my mom would not care. Like, we would be literally at, uh, like, family get, uh, get-togethers, and she wouldn't care. Like, she would slap me in front of everybody for, like, little things, you know? Like, like why are you running? I told you to stop running, and boom. And it's like, everybody was just, like, look the other way. Just like everything. I feel like people, you see something going on, and I get it. People don't want to... People want to mind their business, but sometimes you never know because that person could be alone, and that was me. I mean, my mom abandoned me. I was in a household where I wasn't very welcomed. Um, and, you know, um, fast forward, um, I was about 12, 13 years old, and I didn't know she was in my mother until I was about 13, 13 years old. She would always keep my uh, my birth certificate away from me, and I would always wonder that was really weird. And all my cousins would always tell me, like, hey, that's not your mom. Like, your real mom is your aunt. And I would be like, what? And she would always deny it. Like, they're crazy, this and that. And until one day. So before you get into all of that, I want to go back to, like, I remember my story started when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. When did you start realizing, like, you were being treated differently? Uh, Man, it was everything. Since I was, yeah, since I could remember. Since I was, like, six, seven years old, my mom would go get fries and hamburgers. And she would never ask me if I wanted some um we would get candy she would get candy and everything like that she would be like you can't get some 
you and that's the main reason why i would get beaten up because my mom wouldn't let me have food and candy and i would always have to go like around my way and sneak and get it you know and i would like sneak it in my room and eat it at night and i would get in trouble a lot for that because she'd be like why are you eating candy and this and that it's like well because you wouldn't let me have none Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and that's the reason why i would get like whipped and all that stuff Okay, so you she hid your birth certificate and, mm-hmm. and you finally realized that's not your real mom. Right. And that's when they literally all hit me. Like, it's just, it's like, this feeling I can never describe. It's like, like in a way, like you kind of knew, but like you were a little bit undeniable. In a way, it's kind of like, like, dang, you know? And yeah, from there, honestly, I did turn very rebellious because it was like, you know what? You're not even my mother. Like, I really don't have anybody. Like, crap. Because my dad, that was actually my my biological uncle blood related uncle he would always be off at work you know us you know you know hispanic dads are always constantly working working so hard well that was him and whenever um my mom would uh like beat me and i would bleed like she would always tell me like oh tell your dad that you like fell off the slide at school or tell him this or like always have to lie to him you know always say that you fell like this and that because she didn't want to look bad in front of him and even when like he did notice like he will call her out sometimes like why are you hitting her so hard like you're you're you know you're overdoing it and it would always lead into an argument and that's when i stopped saying stuff because she was starting to tell me like you're gonna affect my like my uh my marriage with him it's gonna be all your fault and it's like dang like i can't even speak up or say anything about it because i feel like i want to make it worse you why know? do you think she it sounded like she hated you why do you think she she hate dislike you so much you know i've always always wondered that until this day and i don't know i really don't know i feel like because i mean growing up uh, um it turns out that you know i know she had depression as well um i know she did suffer with a lot of depression and I don't know if it was just me because giving her, like, problems like that. Like I said, like, the main reason why I would get, like, you know, whooping for it was, like, for, like, little things like getting candy and stuff. And I feel like that and turning into, like, arguments with, you know, with my dad. So I feel like she would, like, blame all that stuff on me. I don't know why it was, you know. Um, I, yeah, I really don't know. Like but she I didn't was, treat her children like that. No, I mean, most, well, you know. Like I said, she had six other children, but they were older already. So the only person was really raised in one was my brother. And he was probably the only person that would, like, stick up for me. But, again, he was at school most of the time or out with his friends and stuff like that. Um, My sister and my brother would always try to take me out because my mom would never take me out. So they would always be like, you know, let's go watch a movie and stuff like that. So they would – my brothers and sisters were very, like – like, they never saw me, like, as not their sister. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you ask them, they will never say, oh, yeah, well, no, we picked her up or we adopted her. <laughs> you know, they yeah, would always yeah. just be like, yeah, that's my sister, you know. Yeah, but, but you weren't were... stealing candy. You were trying to get food. You were, right. you were trying to get fed. Right, right, was, right. Yeah. But like I said, you know, when you don't like somebody, it's kind of like, I guess, in a way, like, oh, you can't have none of this. You yeah. know, like, you can have none of this good stuff, you know? Oh, like, <laughs> trust me, I know. I, our, our story is so similar. I grew up like that, too. I wasn't allowed to have certain foods. If I'm having a cracker, you can only, I remember right. seven crackers. I'm only allowed to have seven crackers. Right. And to this day, it's just so traumatizing for me. I would eat 14 crackers instead of seven because, just because I can. Oh, my God. So I get it. And have you confronted her, like, with all this stuff? Have you ever so, confronted her? Yes. So, I mean, okay. So, fast forward, um, you know, it, do, it did take me a while. Like I said, I, I dealt with depression myself. I thought about suicide as the age of 13, 14. Like, I remember I had a bag of pills under my bed just because I was ready. Because, like, I was just so fed up. I was so fed up. Um, and, you know, I you could never, like, bring it up to her. I remember one time in the, my whole entire life, somebody stuck up for me. She took me to Mexico, right? Because she claimed that I was very, like I said, I was being a little rebellious. I was, like, you know, ditching school and stuff like that. And she was like, oh, like, I'm going to take you to Mexico. We're going to take you to, like, this rehab because she, like, swore I was, like, I don't know, like, a crackhead or something. And, I mean, the only thing I was doing was just, like, like smoking weed. That was it, you know? But, yeah, she swore, like, I wasn't a virgin anymore, that I was, like, you know, a I was a hoe. Like, she swore, like, I had lost my virginity, and I was, like, yeah, crazy, right? 
she took me to Mexico, and then I'll the go lady, back to the virginity thing. Is that a big thing in your culture to uh, be married yeah. with your virginity? Yeah, I mean, because yeah, even they're Mexican, they like want to, res- they want you to respect your body and this and that. But my mom was like very strict on me. Like she would not mm. let me have friends. She would not let me go out. Never be around a boy. Remember one time I was walking from school, and this boy like kind of liked me, and he got off the bus with me, and I was like, please, like do not walk with me, because my mom's gonna pick me. She normally picks me up while I'm walking home. And he was like, no, like, I'll, I'll, I'll walk with you. And I was like, no, like, you don't understand. And, yeah, sure enough, a minute after, my mom pulled up. And she was like, get your ass in the car, like, in Spanish. Yeah. I got in the car. And she, like, I don't know what she told the kid. But the kid went, like, whoa, and just, like, <laughs> ran out. And my mom just, like, slapped me with all her might in the car. And I was like, dude, like, I didn't even do nothing. Like, So is this in the U.S.? Yes, this was all here. This was literally like I live. I went to school in Centennial, Centennial High School. Yeah, this was all it's right in here. Vegas. Yes, this is all here. I lived my whole life in here in Vegas. Carl, you're telling me my story. That happened to me too. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes, that same thing happened to me. And and uh, our you know the person who was raising me was so mad because I was walking with a boy. Yeah. No. Wow. Yeah. Like like you're sending flashbacks here. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, and like I said, she was very strict on me on that part. Um, but later on, like I said, um, you know, uh, I every time. Oh, so yeah, she took me to Mexico to see like, oh, yeah, she's this and that. The lady did an interview. I guess it was like some like rehab center or something like that for like really like brat kids, like kids who are like really like, you know, like there's no saving you, you know. And the lady like sat with me in an interview. I mean, an interview like, yeah, pretty much an interview, like in a, in a room by myself. And she's like, all right. I want you to be very honest with me, and I promise it's going to be 100% confidential. Like, she was telling me, like, open up to me, tell me what has been happening. And I was super scared to tell her, like, about my mom. Like, you know, uh, the real truth is that my mom, like, you know, she has, like, beating me, like, since I was a child for, like, little, like, little things, you know, like. And honestly, I don't remember too much about it, but I remember I did tell her everything. And she literally told my mom, like, she doesn't belong here. She literally does not belong here. I don't even know why you're bringing her here. You know, your daughter is is fine, you know? And she, like... Let me ask you this. Why do you think she was bringing you there? Because she thought that I was, like... Like I said, she thought that I was, like, I wasn't a virgin no more, that I was, like, on some crack and all But is that the reason, or was she trying to get rid of you? No, because she was waiting for me. She was waiting for me after the interview. Okay. And, and, um... And it was, you know, it was crazy because, um... My mom, for the first time, was opening up about her her childhood story. Mm -hmm. And how she would get beaten up as a child. And that's probably, like, the only time when I kind of understood her because I, I still don't feel like, you know, it justifies anything. But in a way, like, I'm such a person that, like, I I see, how do you say it? I don't know how, the word. But for once, like, I was kind of able to see why she was the way she Because so, so I would you, ask why yeah. was she the way she was. But, but I want to go back to something you said and challenge you on that because even though you're seeing – because we talk about generational curses and generational cycles right, right. and she's living out a generational cycle she wasn't treating her kids the way she was treating right you. right right so she was able to you, control that with her children you know what there was actually one one of her child that she did treat like that okay and it's my sister and to this day my sister has a lot a lot of of problems like she deals with depression takes depression pills like everything because okay, so she did she's treat the her only kids. yeah okay. she's the only person mm-hmm. who went similar to what i did mm-hmm. but and like i said she's probably one of the persons that like uh, that's like stuck up for me like that she's like don't be treating her like that the way you treated me because same thing my mom pulled like a gun to her head and all these crazy things yeah oh my and God. my sister to this day is like traumatized by everything she's been put through as well and and it's crazy because my sister is older than me and i literally give her advice how i was able to like deal with everything and to this day how i'm able to like like not leave it behind but kind of like go through it without having to affect my everyday life so is it safe for you to share all this here that it's going to go public is it safe you know i i thought about this um like a week before you know all of this and i feel like it is something super important because again it's something that you know that people need to hear Mm -hmm. because just like you like we have stories that need to be told because i feel like that is a way for other people to also heal from the same things because we all have our our different ways of healing through things because even though like everything i'm gonna say like about everybody and her mostly i just do want to point out that like 
in my way i did forgive her and like a good friend said i didn't forgive her for her but i forgave her for me yes so i can move on and it's not like i have like a lovey dovey relationship with her but i have a decent relationship with her where like you know we call each other like how you doing hi okay that's good i'll come over this and that and and leave and just like that you know i see her probably like i don't know maybe like once a month twice a month stuff like that just because like i said all the things that led to today you know there was a time where i completely cut her off from my life Mm -hmm. and um and like something like i said it's just i started seeing it as like it sucks you did do all these things to hurt me i don't know why i understand you got put through even probably worse situations than me because I guess mm-hmm. her father used to beat her for no reason. Like, all right. of them. She's a daughter from 16. No, thir- sorry, 13. Mm-hmm. And uh, my grandpa used to get home and, like, uh, beat on all of them. Like, for no reason at all. So, I'm guessing her, she, instead of her healing her trauma and saying, you know what, I'm not going to do that to my kids. She let it get the best of her. And sometimes it's the demons that you get stuck with that right. you're like, it's all you know is to mistreat people right so i feel like we were her perfect puppets you know well not even the puppets it's all she it's all she knew she didn't know yeah. how to uh how to be that loving nurturing mother right. because right. Right. she didn't have a role exactly. model exactly so she's bringing that but you some at some point got out of that tell us yes. about that how did you get out of that yes yeah, so so once um all that was over you know i did what i did um um, I got caught um, running, well, run away from the house twice, but this time, like, I was leaving, like, at 1, 2 in the morning to go to parties, because I guess she would never let me out. Uh, so, one time, I got, I left, like, I went to in the morning, they're like, hey, we have a cool party. And, oh, another thing, too, um, she would never let me have phones, that I always keep, like, a little phone hidden, and that's another reason why I would get beat really bad for it, because she would catch me, like, where did you get this phone from, you know, and... Um, so one time I was like, they were texting me like, there's going to be a really cool party on this side of town. Like, you need to come. We'll pick you up. And they're like, okay. So it was like one, two in the morning. I wait for them to sleep. And I, yeah, I got dressed. And I would always leave like the garage door, like, uh, like unlocked. So I can just sneak right through the outdoor. And, you know, I left, right? Well, and it turns like to five, six in the morning. And I'm like, okay, guys, who's going to drop me off? And like, well, the person that dropped you off left. And I'm like, okay, I need to get home because if I don't get home, you're not going <laughs> to understand. My mom will literally kill me. Uh-huh. And they're like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Nobody has a car. Everybody left like at three, two in the morning or three, four in the morning. And they were like, um, I don't know how to get you home. And I was like, no, like, how am I going to get home? And I even brought a friend with me. And she's like, how am I going to get home now? <laughs> and fast forward um she found out i never got home on time she ended up getting really mad at me and threw everything out in the front of the house like she threw all my stuff out like she's like you don't belong here no more like my sister actually ended up since it was close to one of my sister's house i ended up uh being at her house and i told her what was going on and she's like your mom's gonna be very mad at you and i was like i know and she's like well you know stay here for tonight and then i'll talk to her yeah she talked to her. she's like your mom has nothing to do with you she said that you're no longer welcome to the house and she threw all your stuff away and yeah, sure enough, we she even tried. She's like, "Well, I'm gonna try again. Let's go drive to her house and you know just tell her what you did and that you're sorry and then, you know maybe everything will be good." We drove to her house. Everything was in the front of the house. My shoes, everything. I had a little job at that time. You know, it was like fifth. I was like 16, 17. Had a job and everything. Even the stuff I worked hard for, it was like all out on the floor. People had already picked a lot of the stuff up. A lot of the things were missing as well. And yeah, she just went out and she cut. She's like, "I don't want you around my property. You're this. You're that. You're that." And my sister was like, well, I guess I'll talk to my husband. I'll say, we can take you in, you know. And they were traumatized because they're like, damn, you sneaking out of the house. Like, that doesn't even look good on me, you know. But fast forward, um, uh, I ended up leaving my sister's house after eight months to go live with one of my brothers. Can I confirm this is the sister yeah. from, from no, this? No, another sister. But she left the house very young, so okay. she didn't have to endure. She got married very young, so okay. she didn't have to endure everything me and my sister went through. Um mostly it was my sister the other one mm-hmm. but no this is like i said it's six of us so um yeah she didn't really have to endure everything we went through yeah how and are you handling all this mentally as you know you're, you're how, how are you dealing with this how, how is it making you feel knowing that you got kicked out of the house and it, it seems like even though you were going through all that you were, yeah. you're still yeah. intent on being rebellious too yes like, yeah. yes um i just feel like um you, you know you just grow from it like it's it's hard it's hard because at first I was really mad and sad over cry all the time. Even when I was in my sister's house, I was like, dang it, man, like I screwed up big time, you know. But in a way, I was kind of relieved 
because I feel for the first time in my life, I finally flew away, like from that place that, you know, that I was so sad and destroyed from, you know? So Mm -hmm. in a way for me, it was like a relief, like, wow, like God finally relieved me from all this, you know? And like I said, after I went to move on with my other family member, um, I met this boy. And he was actually from the same high school I went to. We ended up talking, we ended up dating. And that person um, ends up be- being my, um, being, sorry, we're passing tissues. <laughs> <laughs> that person ended up being, um, you know, the father of my child. I ended up being pregnant. And then that's when, uh, everything just goes downhill again like I feel like I only catch the break for like a year and a half and then when I met him um I go went into this really dark place um he was doing very very bad things um illegal things and it got so bad that we you know we started arguing next thing you know it's just a domestic violence thing um the same thing it's just i feel like like you know like i said at that network and even i just feel like i couldn't catch a freaking break you know it was like dang it man like right when i feel like life is going <laughs> it's going all right yeah. all right it's like dang it like same thing uh, when we were last time we ever had an altercation like that we were at the we we're at the bowling alley at santa fe and he slapped me in front of everybody super hard and he had my child in my in his hands and and I looked around and everybody was like this. I just looked in the other way, like, oh. like minding their business. And I was like, awesome, cool. And yeah, um, after that, I mean, after everything I had to endure with him, every time I would try to leave, he would always like be like, if you leave, I will kill myself. Like, it's just, it was just crazy. It was honestly so bad. Um, he ended up going to jail. Mm-hmm. And um, I had a car. You know, my actually my very first car um, that I had that's the car I had to sleep in because, again, when I was pregnant, um, so his mom, my baby daddy's mom, actually suffers from schizophrenia. And that's another story. It's crazy <laughs> living in a home with schizophrenia because after I got pregnant, I ended up moving with him. And it was very toxic. I mean, they would always say bad mean things to each other. They'd always beat on each other. Like, he would even hit his mom. It was, it was I mean, it was, it's just crazy. But you felt that was normal because you're used to that. Exactly. For me, yeah. it was like, oh, violence is normal because yeah. that was, <laughs> that was <laughs> I was raised around, you know? Uh-huh. But I, I didn't think it was normal for even a child to hit their mother. That was, like, something that I was, like, not used to. Yeah. But, again, like, he would even hit me. So it's like, dang it. Like, you know, we're all, you know, it was, it's just crazy. But... So pretty much um, after he got locked up, um, his mom took me in. She's like, you know what? Come over. And I knew it was going to be, she didn't like me at all. I knew it wasn't going to be good news. She's like, you know, come, come with me. That's why I was living. I was living in my car for like about a week. She said, come with me and just, just stay with us. So you had the baby living in the car? And no, it was, I was pregnant. You was remember? pregnant. Yes, you I was okay, about good. six, six, seven months pregnant. Mm-hmm. Really big. And I'm telling you, when I was sleeping in my car, it was the scariest thing in my life. Yeah. scariest thing in my life because like i was scared someone's gonna find me jack me out of my car because i was so i'm still so petite and just imagine yeah you know i was even more like i was so skinny i just had a big belly i was so scared for my life I would wake up like at four in the morning and be like okay i'm still alive i'm still <laughs> so safe yeah. and i'll go back to bed but uh she was like you know what come into my house you know you can live here just pay rent i was like yeah it's fine i can help you out with rent well because i was i had like a grocery store a grocery store grocery job at that time as a cashier so yeah i was i was and i'm like yeah i'm help you out with bills okay well third day she goes like hey i need you to um take me to go see him in jail and i was like i can't i have work she's like well i don't know how you're gonna do it but you have to take me and i was like i can't take you she's like okay we're well, not gonna take me just get the fuck out then and i was like are you serious and she's like yeah i'm serious and i'm like oh lord so i she wanted swear. to use you she brought you Yo, in yeah to use you. for my car because yeah, she didn't car. have a yeah. car and yeah and, and and even so i would help her I remember one time she wanted right. to go see her boyfriend at some uh, i don't know some swami or something i dropped her off picked her up because i was like you know what you're helping yeah. me out. i'm gonna help you out but now when i had work you know i was like i have work i can't lose my job i'm already pregnant if i leave my job who's gonna hire me with a six-month belly yeah let's yeah. be honest you know let's be real but yeah i remember that's when i had another breaking point girl i'm telling you i i had every all i had to my name was a bag of clothes Right. And some perfumes and my work shoes and a blanket. I remember I put everything in this big white clear bag. I put it on my back, pregnant and everything. I was so angry. I was like, God, like, come on, man. Like, really? And I remember I threw everything in the 
and my and my trunk and she still had the audacity to come out yell at me grabbed a, a can of a, it was like a modelo was sitting out there in the street picked it up and threw it all over my car <laughs> i was like so angry girl i looked at her with these eyes like oh like oh you know i shut my i shut my door like i said when i gave her that look she even looked at me like oh you know, like, <laughs> I've been no mess with her. Yes, and I remember yeah. I just got in my car, slammed the door. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, being late to work, and I was, I was driving to work. I was angry and furious because I, everything was just coming to me. Like, dang it, man, my mom abandoned me as a child. I got abused as a child. Everything, this, everything, that. And I was like, like I swear, like for me, it's like, dang it, man. Like, can I get good yeah. already? Like, what is going on? And so yeah, where, where was your turning point? So right there. So as um, I was driving to driving to uh, the grocery store a girl so crazy i was you know counting my money before starting my shift this girl um her name is tanya and i'm still really good friends with her she's actually my business partner now um we were counting our our money and then she looked at me and i was like trying to wipe my tears i was like all right keep it together you know i don't want nobody to ask me what's going on and i and i swear to you i had no friends or nothing because i had lost all my friends throughout the years and everything and she looked at me she was like what's wrong and I, when she said that, I was like, finally, finally, somebody asked me what's wrong. And I don't know what happened, girl, but something in me just told her everything, like mm. everything from jump to like finish all in the span of like five minutes. I don't know how. And I was telling her, I'm like, I can't find a roommate because I can't afford one. Cheapest thing is 400 bucks. I can't even afford that. And then it's so crazy how like God put her in my way because she's like, you know, what's so crazy. I have a room for 200 bucks. Like, come, come. And I was like, yes, like, I'm homeless. Like, yes, <laughs> in a heartbeat. So, yes, we met up after she got me close with God. After she got me close with God, like, I feel like I was in my journey. Because he was in jail, so I didn't I didn't have none of that no more. And I told him, once you get out of jail, like, I don't, really don't want, like, nothing with you. And if you are, you really have to change. Like, you really have to change. Not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to change. And, oh, here I go again, like a dummy. Yeah, Back to you. Yeah. No, like, you literally have to change. Um, she got me close with God. I got close with my child after I gave birth to him. And all that around that period, too, I was not talking to my mom at all, neither. Right. And um, my mom reached out to me. And she was like, oh, I'm trying to be like, buddy, but friends with me again, whatever. I got out. He got out. He found me where I was living because nobody knew where I, like, I was staying at. He found me. And somehow he's like, I'm changed. Fast forward, he never changed. It yeah. was terrible. I had a friend. My friend slept with him behind his back. I mean, it was just crazy. Right. A lot of things were happening all over again. I was like, God dang it. Finally, one day I was striving and I just really said no more. Like I really just picked up and I said, just no more. No more. Good. Got a good job as a secretary, saved my money. And that's when I finally got my first apartment by myself. I was paying six twenty five right there on Linwood Street. It was like a little bit ghetto, but you know what? That's when I finally yeah. was like, okay, knew me. Everything is, has to change because I'm just sick of it. Like, I'm sick of not catching my... And I feel like I will put myself in this position. Right. I feel sometimes we we don't admit and we put ourselves in these positions because nobody told me to go back with him. Nobody told me to tolerate all these things, you know? And I should have started a lot sooner, but I was like, you know what? It's a fresh start. Everything was going good. And that's when I got... Uh, like I said, I was working at the uh, as a job at the secretary. I was saving my money. Uh, paying my car and then I was driving with a little Hyundai Elantra at that time and I that's when I finally met my significant other on Instagram and he he, he literally messaged me like um telling me not to put my baby my baby daddy drama on my Instagram that's how we started talking <laughs> oh my god because <laughs> he was like you know baby daddy's making you so mad you're like dang it you know but you were and putting all your yeah, drama on Instagram. yeah and he was like stop being so immature and I was like you know what you're lucky kind of right you're right and that's how we started talking we ended up meeting and this guy I'm telling you I, and it's crazy because at that time I told him that I actually want to start a business at that time. Like, finally, like, it was coming to me. Like, because when you're alone, you literally have nobody but your child. And you're like, how am I going to take my child out of this now, you know? And my my child was the main reason why I no longer wanted to be in a toxic relationship. And right. no longer, and I even wanted to be that mother that was presented to me because I didn't want him to endure what I had endure. And because I didn't want him to even grow up like his father. Like, I didn't want him to see, like, oh, that's that's okay. That's okay for to beat on woman because I see it. Yeah. I didn't want to put myself with, I didn't want to be selfish. And I feel like a lot of women are selfish because they're like, but I love him so much and I'm not willing to leave. No, but you have to think of your child. Don't think of him. Think of your child. 
because people are like no but it's my honey and the child no it's your child because your your honey is beating you and doing all these crazy things to you so you gotta yeah. leave that behind so do you feel like when you made that decision to pull the trigger and mm-hmm. say no more yeah i've had enough of this that's when things started happening good things start yes. happening in your life yes yes and a hundred percent my child because even when i when i i feel like giving up i just think about him because he is so amazing like he's so loving and caring and and just goofy and i mean he's just everything everything yeah. like i need like i literally like they say when you need when you need a certain love from like something like god gives it to you and it was definitely him like my child was everything like even when i feel like giving up when my depression was kicking back in like it was like no get your butt up start cleaning the house start cooking dinner start doing this or doing that and i wanted so much for my life that i was like okay now i need to step it up yeah. and that's when i was i, I met my, my spouse and and he was like well what do you want to do with your life you know because he was he's like so smart and everything and he was like what do you want to do with your life and he was like i was like i really want to start a business i really want to make six figures i really want to do this i want to do that and it'll start it'll start by getting my real estate license i have had an opportunity at a at a, at a uh, private company where i can sell uh you know condos luxury condos and that's where literally the money started coming in and they teach me so much about psychology sales i can tell people if you want to be successful, at least start with one type of one type of job that has sales. Because when you learn about sales, like that would help you out in anywhere in life. Even if you have a business, because you can leave your sales job, but you can literally implement everything from that sales job, like psychology, knowing how to talk to people, everything into your own business. And yeah. that's and that's feel like that's where I ended up going. After being there for two years, um, you know, me and my spouse ended up building building like a little empire between us. We you know we we got out of there because he ended up like um, living living with me and then we got a house and then we got a bigger house i mean it just all went from there you know and and about seven months ago that's when i got my maserati and it was like my dream car like when i saw <laughs> it for the first time that's when i was like this is what i want and i worked so hard for it i built my credit i saved my money and all of yeah. the above so yes that's awesome and and you didn't uh, way back when when you look at your life now like i never thought for a minute i could be where i am today yes and yes. that's such resiliency to show your son that you can get out of that and build a life for yourself. So one of the things we've been doing on the show is, um, uh, you know, we've implemented something new where our audience have been asking questions, Ashley. And mm-hmm. one of the questions our audience have asked is, how can you best achieve mental clarity? And you've gone through so much and there was just so much in your head, right? And all the things you've gone through, you mentioned depression. What do you do to achieve mental clarity now to run your business and, and you know, to be successful in life? So definitely two things. So for one, I honestly do it a lot when I'm driving. I literally don't really play music at all like that. And I feel like that's when I can focus more, like even when I need like, um, like as you know, like you said, clarity about anything that's going on with my business or anything that's going on just with life overall. Um, and another thing is when I'm at home, I like to go to a certain spot in my house. And for me, it's honestly my closet because my closet yeah. is like it's kind of like the size of this room, and I have like a bunch of clothes everywhere. But it's like <laughs> also organized like by color. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's like my safe space. Yeah, I like to go there, and I have a little bench where I like to kind of like pray in there. It's like a little bench that you normally say to put your heels on, mm-hmm. but I like to like kneel down there and kind of like sit and like, just like talk to God. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, God, this is what's going on. And that's like, like the most important thing is just building a relationship with your higher self or with the person who you call God. Like, it, mm-hmm. you know, I know everybody has like different religions or for some people is meditation, for some people is praying, whatever you call it, but kind of like pray, you know, mm-hmm. like, God gave me strength because I feel like that's what has been helping me throughout the years is him giving me the strength. And Thank he you. tells yeah. me that I'm strong, even when I don't think I'm strong, you yeah. know. And for me, that is like the biggest thing, like give me strength, give me signs. How can I do with this? How can I do with that? And I and one of the most important things a lot of people don't do is to sit there in silence and just listen mm-hmm. to him. Like give him let him give you all the thoughts and just just honestly just take everything in the silence mm-hmm. the peace and that's when you get the clarity thank you and and i agree mental clarity comes in different facets of for different people and in different phases of their lives for me one of the things that really gives me mental clarity is i like to hop on my bike early in the morning and go riding up blue diamond and and it just clears my head 
and it helps me to think better. So whatever works for you, I hope we've answered your questions. And until next time.